America is a relatively new country. We don't have like old Templar night churches. To me, that's the old recording studios. Those are kind of our temples, our castles. A traditional studio that's properly put together can be a magical place. We call them temples of sound. The first time I walked into a recording studio, I knew that's where I wanted to be. It's really about a, an environment uh, that was specifically created for recording. So it's not in someone's house or basement. It's a specific place just for the process of making music. The traditional recording studio has just got to be an environment that fosters creativity and gives everyone an opportunity to make something magical. When I was growing up in bands, the only dream we had was, we gotta go get in the studio. When bands do finally make that decision that they, you know what, let's take our game up a little bit. Most of the time they think about going into a studio. If you wanted to do a multi-track production, you kind of had to go someplace that had a pretty fair amount of relatively expensive gear. And there weren't a lot of people with experience in operating that gear and getting stuff done that way. So you automatically by engaging that process, you brought yourself into a kind of a, a certain level of participation. You know, you just want to get out of your environment and go to this new place where the entire focus is about creating this art. You know, it's about the, the environment and the character, the vibe and the accommodations and the service so that you get your job done. And uh, of course, the equipment should all be pristine and, and everything should be there so you can, you know, create your art in the most respectful fashion. The benefit of the recording studio has always been the kind of temple, the safe space for an artist to go, you know, for musicians to go. I think it helps when they're well equipped, regardless of uh, how elaborate the design might be. I think it helps to have instruments and equipment that's available to musicians or artists that don't have access to those things usually. You know, they, for instance, maybe they've always been using a synthesizer for a piano patch or an organ patch. To some degree, there's a real experience when they sit behind a real piano. You know, different things happen. Accidents happen. Try and really make the technical aspect work in support of the musical aspect. If you have ideas or if you're getting creative, you don't want to wait to get into the creative process. You want to say, I want to be able to do this, and a good engineer will have you ready to do that quickly. You know, we worked in these amazing facilities. We could have anything we wanted. We had all the best studios, we had all the best gear, the best musicians, the best engineers, the best producers, the best writers, everyone who was at the top of their game. The acoustics that you're recording in make a pretty big imprint on the recording that you make. The room accentuates the music you put in there. I love how they sound. I mean, how acoustically it's just peaceful and it somehow I find that very focusing. Well-designed studios with well-designed control rooms and, and well-designed uh, isolation rooms are invaluable. There's no replacing the sound quality that, that you can get. The space factor is enormous. Hospital-grade power and all the floating floors and custom hanging ceiling and just doing everything like acoustically correct and the lighting, changing the, being able to change the color. Like, it's a, it's a creative environment, it's a fun environment, people are comfortable, 
just want to feel creative. And we hear all the time people say, I never worked so creatively so fast. I just felt I was just in the space and it's just, it's neat and you just feel creative and you just kind of get into your work. I love being in studios. I love it. I've always loved it since I was a kid. It always seemed like this incredibly cool laboratory, you know? And I love that environment. You can come here and be as loud as you want. Nobody will come and tell you not to be. Being able to check out on reality of the world and be able to just be in this space and doing your own thing and not have to worry about what's what else is happening is like very powerful. People don't often think about the building the facility really being part of the tool. They think about it when they're in their basement and the heater kicks on in the middle of the take. And they think about it when the train goes by. Or they think about it when it starts raining. But when you're in a building like this, uh, those things aren't problems. The studio in themselves have the expertise and history behind them to, I think, improve upon what the general public can do. I make it a point with almost every record that I make to include some aspect of the recording in a quote-unquote real recording studio. It's important. You know, you go to the right place, it's not gonna get worse, <laughs> you know? It can only, you know, there's only levels of winning. Just spend a little money on it. They see that and they experience that and they feel like music stars and they should feel like music stars. They deserve that. And I think it certainly doesn't hurt their performance. This person is renting a space, buying a space. They're buying more and more equipment. They're putting in the effort to make this a business. First of all, you have to absolutely love what you do. You have to really love it. It's not an easy business. I mean, you're working very hard for a very boutique industry. And even regardless of a studio space, you know, the engineer is, is probably more important than the room, you know? It's the always been the engineer, and then the gear, and then the room, to me. The mix of the really good, talented people that we have, where we have the music, the ears, the understanding of corporate communications, the understanding of, of broadcast. I know my limitations, and I depend heavily on the engineer. I trust their ears. I trust their instincts. Now, at the end of the day, I'm producing the project, and the final call is obviously mine, but I love working with engineers who are also musicians who know me and have the kind of relationship with me where they want my music to be the best it can be. I'm not a transaction to them. I think the three of us as individuals are all smart enough to realize that we're not very intelligent. <laughs> so we, we're better off just to like listen to somebody that knows what the hell they're talking about. Okay, at this point, he's like the fourth member. Like he just really, really clicked with us. He'll have an idea, we listen. We're not, you know, like, no, that's stupid or whatever, unless it's stupid, which is very rare. First of all, the energy in the control room for me is special. I think that translates for the artist. The artist has a little audience, but a very loving and supportive one. Right. Tony is a great vocal coach. I've really never found anybody else who makes me feel as supported. Like, he, he won't just say, great vocal, you know, like, which <laughs> so many people do. Like, he gives me very, specific feedback, and I like that. The important aspect of the recording process is that you go somewhere that makes you feel creative and you have people around you that help you feel creative. I think a lot of people can record themselves at home, but I know for me, I need to collaborate with people. And you know, really, when you can as, devote your time to just the one aspect, you can do it so much better than when you're trying to split yourself between all these different roles. I don't trust myself completely just to do everything on my own. I don't know if I have enough love to make an entire record all by myself, but I know with 12 other people, we could certainly get up enough love and emotion mm. to invest that record. And that's what it is about being in a studio, it's that process. One of the reasons why I've been playing music and playing in bands for as long as I have now is because I get to have very close relationships where we have shared goals and those relationships that I get through my band are probably the most important adult relationships that I have. But when I'm working with people and they value the integrity of the music as much as I do, then I can trust them. And this is how I know they do, because they're not afraid to tell me 
Nah, dude. I, I wouldn't do that. Having been in bands and being a musician makes me sympathetic to the bands that I'm working with. It also gives me a perspective where I, I kind of understand their problems, you know, and if there's a conflict or if there's a, a, some problem, it's, it's likely a problem that I've experienced firsthand, and so it makes me sympathetic. And in some cases, I'll have an insight of how to get through a situation without, you know, ruffling anybody's feathers or without causing an additional suffering. Everything for me is about the sound. I will talk to guitar players, and guitar players who've worked with me would, would back me up. I will literally talk to them about, I need something that goes, eh, 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 you know, and they'll go, oh, like a... I think there's a sense of play in it, with me in the studio, and there's a sense of uh, exploration and curiosity, uh, which hopefully they find fun and, uh, and useful. I'm gonna be able to help you achieve your vision and you're gonna be happy with your product and you're gonna run out and you're gonna go wanna sell your product. Part of our job is to give it longevity and depth. Putting things that, that you know will be discovered, not on the fifth listen, not on the 10th listen, but maybe on the 15th listen. Because there's nothing better for me than when someone says, Steve, what's that little sound that's on that song? And you go, now for you to know that little sound means you've heard that song 15, 20 times. And if you've heard that song 15 or 20 times, it means that it means something to you. I think it's important to find people, whether it's engineers or mastering people or whoever, mixers that, you know, inevitably can have a stake in what it is you do. I've always, always enjoyed being in a big studio. Um, it feels better, it sounds better. All that stuff is great, but there's limitations there. There was only a limited selection of professional audio gear that was available in the 50s and 60s. And Technosonic had all of it. It had the big microphones, the instruments, the reverb chambers, the EMT-140s, and uh, Ampex tape recorders. And Mr. Harrison was always keen on getting the latest thing. So we had access to virtually everything. But it was a concrete floor, the transite walls, and you're familiar with that material, it's a kind of a hard asbestos-like material with holes drilled in it. So it was very institutional. We had big incandescent lights in the control room. And uh, I spoke to Jeff Emmerich about this, and he laughed because it's just like Abbey Road. But the fact is, most professional recording studios in that era were equipped very similarly. Working on Gravity Kill stuff, it's funny, you know, console and all my outboard gear, samplers and synthesizers and you know my Pro Tools rig and I would take it with me like if we went to go mix down I needed to stick it on a truck and drive the whole studio out I needed to hit the play button and we needed to play everything off of the keyboards trigger everything MIDI wise and then record it onto two inch tape and now literally that entire studio is on my laptop when we first started recording we were recording on four track cassettes uh, when Pro Tools really came online, when people started legitimately using it on major label records, uh, it changed for us because it allowed us to actually get a record done quicker. When I started, all the recording equipment was custom built. It was an eight input, two bus, four track console. So each, it was custom made by Bob Bushnell uh, using API components back when all the consoles were handmade. There was no such thing as an off-the-shelf mixing console. You would hire a company uh, to build the console for you. History-wise, one used to be able to buy a two-inch 24-track in the 70s and a simple automated console that was tape automated and uh, say about $120,000, $140,000 in equipment, not the studio, and charge about $120 an hour. Now we have much more invested than that, and we can't charge 120 an hour, so we have to be pretty clever. In the 90s, when software started getting easy and available, and eventually by the end of the 90s started getting cheap, uh, everything changed drastically, because then uh, all, of the pe all of our clients had their own software and they had their own studios, even if it was just in a broom closet in their production house, in their office. Um, agencies that 
previously had shied away from setting up a studio because it was a quarter million dollars to set up a studio. Now they're saying, really? So we can go out and spend like 10 grand and have a decent enough room where we can do all of our demos for our clients in-house? Uh, that just gutted the business. The, the availability of the software, how inexpensive it was, it just gutted the business. Having, you know, the software, the software that you can actually put it down, get it down, get it the way you sound, the way you want it to sound, and the way you like it, and then that could be your album. Software is getting cheaper, and people are expecting to pay low prices for software. So the days of spending, you know, hundreds of dollars for individual pieces of software is really doesn't exist anymore. Now I think as industries change to the extent that everybody has a little recording device, it's not as good of an idea to spend huge amounts of money. We have to figure out how to deliver uh, that extra quality and still be reasonably priced. Quality of audio is, has always been driven by the technology right back to the point where drummers played very quietly because there was no amplification. And then all of a sudden you got electric guitars and drummers played louder. So now the, the, the art form has always been led by technology. You know, multi-track recording led to the Beach Boys and multi-layered harmonies. Studio design led to the Bee Gees doing jive talking and those tight records from roughly 75 to mid 80s is really idealized in a lot of people's minds. And those of us who were going through it didn't understand that this would be the case. It's, it's like when I was in high school, a friend of mine had a 68 Camaro. I mean, you know, who knew? It was just a car. But now people look back on the whole patina of the business in those days and attribute a lot of it to the equipment. Partly it was because we were always fighting the equipment, but it was a teamwork effort with the musicians and the engineers and the designers and the business people trying to m recreate the moment as best we possibly could. Nowadays, people just create moments uh, from scratch. This is not necessarily bad, but it's a different kind of thing. I didn't enter music to become a typist. That's so much of being a producer now is being a typist. But you must always look behind you. You can only learn from the past. You can't learn from the future because you don't know it yet. This has been this perfect marriage of like lowering budgets, but more efficient recording techniques and technology. When you see a, an ad for a digital audio workstation, it's generally implying that you don't need anybody, you just need our box and you can cut the hits. The challenge of Keeping things current is, is, is difficult too, because by the time you get to the point that you barely pay something off, you gotta buy something new, and the, the, the rate of change is short in this industry. You know, the technology industry, which is what the music business is now, it's a technology industry, you know, it's moving fast. Some people embrace that, and some people are, are a little bit hesitant to embrace it. Now we are on the very technological side of this industry. You know, we're virtualizing basically the whole entire recording studio. Some people love that, other people aren't quite used to it yet. The change that's most affected me as a record producer, for sure, is going from analog to digital. And I love that change. What I really love about it is it enables me to do my day's work quicker. The tools that we use are to make it as inexpensive and as fast as possible, the highest quality with the fastest speed. The middle class studio is the place that's most endangered today because of the pressure from both sides. The latest and greatest and most amazing technology is prohibitively expensive, yet entry level technology is almost free. People are going to have big budgets and they go to the big studio that still has that technology and equipment or they'll just do it themselves or have their nephew do it. They call their bedroom a recording studio and uh, I can't compete with them because they're only charging $15, $20 an hour. It's just plug something into a computer and I'm a recording engineer now. And it's not, you're a recordist. You're someone that is just recording. People want to have this conversation about technology and, and sound, which is which is a good conversation, but the, sort of I think the other conversation is how, how a lot of younger record makers today go about making records. And it's not necessarily in an informed or an organized fashion. No, they're trying to make it up and figure it out as and, to do it. And I think that's a problem. What I'd love to see 
is people treat all audio the way it should be treated instead of an afterthought. The amount of tracks that come in that are distorted, that are labeled improperly, that have bad editing done, that, you know, that are just out of tune. Sing it again. We have a lot of people coming up into this business who have never listened to music other than uh, MP3s through earbuds. And if that's all that somebody has ever experienced, they don't know how good music could sound. They don't understand the difference. People who pay attention to details make great recordings on anything. And that is so much more important than the technology itself. But that being said, the technology has such incredible potential. We live in a good enough society. Stuff that is recorded in, not in a studio is often good enough. When it got to people just listening to music on the stereo speakers on their laptop, or just carrying around their phones, you might as well have just gone back to the AM transistor radio back in the 60s. When I think of older people and their connection to music, it was the experience of, of listening to it, and, and it can be a very enveloping experience. You know, there was a higher preponderance of good sounding systems uh, than there is now, I think. It's, it's interesting that with all the progress and all the technology that we have, most people are listening on worse systems than they were 30 or 40 years ago, which you wouldn't expect. You don't hear horrible audio anymore. The problem is you don't often hear great audio anymore. The average is probably better than it used to be. I used to hate vinyl. For me, vinyl was the weak link in the whole process. S's would tear something terrible on vinyl. So when CDs came in, I thought this was the weak link fixed. But it's the mentality of the people making the music that is changing. You know, when you look at music rather than listen to music, it's going to be different. I loved all aspects of the production, but I was particularly drawn to the reproduction of a moment. I had watched records being made where the performance happens and the tape machine is there and the tape machine is your witness to the performance. And you play it back and that performance, that moment lives. Because there's something really great about the first time a song comes together. When it all gels and everything connects, and you know, those moments when that does happen, if you are lucky enough to capture that to tape, it's really great. There's not much I like more, given enough time <laughs> and, and the right kind of gear, of getting a lot of people on the floor and making the band sound good on the floor and, and uh, doing a big tracking project. It's the love of creating, whether it be spontaneously in a, a live situation, which is unparalleled. What you experience on stage in front of people, you're a lightning rod and you're just receiving and it's music is flowing through you. In the studio, when you're creating something and there are those moments when you're so in it and that happens, it's the same lightning rod and then you sit back and you look at what you've created. That's magic. I think you've got like two, two things going and ultimately it's, it's best if they come to a peak and if you can record it at the peak. You still have the passion and you have performed it enough times to where you're nailing it. The best records are gonna be done when you don't realize you're making them. Artists, when they're thinking about the recording, sometimes take their eye off their art. You don't have a song, you don't have shit. So you couldn't just show up with a room full of cats, you know, on someone's dime and wing some shit that you were gonna compose on the fly in the studio. Right. Whereas unfortunately today, that's exactly what happens. People come to me and say, hey, can you mix this record and make it sound like that? No, I can't. I can mix the record, it's gonna sound great. But the only way it can sound like that is if we get that artist and that studio and those songs and all of that stuff and the time of day we record, like all those things make that record sound the way that it sounds. In the old days, hit records a lot of times used to align with well-made records. It really just comes down to patience. Making sure it's right from square one. You know, I tell a lot of the guys that I work with, especially assistants and things like that, like we don't put our name on it till the quality's in there. And that's the way we have to live by. 
performance is way more important than sound quality. I like hearing emotion come out of something. I can tune you, I can time you, I can make you sound like Katy Perry, I can do all of those things, but I can't give emotion. And that's the one thing that artists still need to be able to provide. You know, it's the music business, I want to be entertained. The most important part about making a record absolutely is uh, not the bass drum sound. It's nothing like that. It's making the song speak to you. And by definition, to make a song speak to someone, it is through the vocal. Just because we have the tools to fix, to edit, to tune, to manipulate, you know, isn't it great just to sing? Listen to those old Motown records. Listen to Aretha Franklin. Listen to some of those great Atlantic records that Tommy Dowd recorded and I think we're losing that in our musicality. People don't play very well because they don't have to. Somebody will play the drums pretty shitty, and then they'll just expect that I'm gonna cut it together and make it better. Or, oh, cool, I played this four bar section, I uh, played it really well, I'm gonna quantize that, and then I'm just gonna loop it everywhere. Okay, well, I mean, that is a way to make records, but that's not a, I mean, it's a way to make records. The work is not as satisfying these days to sit in front of your computer by yourself and fix music. Copying and pasting, for all the downsides of it, it saves people a lot of money. Or tuning their vocal, like it's kind of like, mm, close enough, let's just, eh, 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 right, moving on, moving on, moving on. Now, that hasn't helped live performances at all. People go to shows all the time and they come back, I'm like, how were they? And they're like, they had no business being on stage. Like, it was really terrible, like it was bad. These guys cannot play. And you listen to the record and you're like, and it's like, I know, because there's a lot of trickery more and more people are afraid of committing to things because they don't have to. When I started out, you wanted this guitar tone? That's the guitar tone you were gonna end up with at the end of the day. Now people record the direct signal from the guitar and they'll put an amplifier plug-in on it and they may change it as they're listening throughout or they may just send me the DI'd guitars. Recorded this great bass player once, T-Bone Wolk. Played in Saturday Night Live for years. He played with Hall and Oates. Plays the first verse in the chorus and he stops. He goes, okay, fly it to the second and third. Bullshit. I go, you're T-Bone Woke. Like, you don't get it. You're like the greatest bass player I ever met in my life. Can't you just play it? Cause I know you're gonna play something cool. Yeah, all right, Carl. Punch him in record and he just kills it. And, it, and it's, that's the stuff that I miss. I miss the musicality throughout a song. There's always been boy bands. There's always been pop stars, you know, manufactured music. And that's not gonna change. The difference is, is now you don't have any filters. You know, where before, when I was a kid, record companies were filters. They separated the, the wheat, you know, and it's not nearly as, uh, as easy as it used to be, I think. But we used to have to save up money and go out and buy records and listen to them over and over until we were absolutely sure we didn't like it. Whereas now, it's first listen. I mean, think of all the bands that you, if you listened to one time, would you have ever listened to Bob Dylan more than once if you only, you know, if, it, if you didn't pay for it? The devaluation of the product that we create has sort of affected all aspects of the business. People just don't see the effort and the expense that goes into creating these pieces of art. One thing I learned over the years recording so many different people is how talented people are. So once you get to a certain level, it's this magnetic force that draws people together. And that's why it's a small incestuous business. The players are so damn good. I watched an 18 year old drummer clip just yesterday that blew my mind. And the way that that kid was playing wasn't even taught or believed to be possible when I was growing up. Kids are learning how to play. Now, learning how to play something interesting that someone wants to listen to, not just once, but a couple of times, that's the challenge. If I sound like Beyonce, if I sound like Justin Bieber, am I really as good as they are? And be honest with yourself. Compare your music with theirs and go, no, it's not good enough. I'm going to keep working until I get something that is as good. Over the past couple of years, it's just like uh, things have slowed down and slowed down and slowed down. Well, first of all, most of them have really closed down. But the others are still around. They're struggling. 
has been tricky for sure because right when we opened up the studio was in 2006. And if we remember back then, nobody had any money to do anything. And you just don't see the people like we used to see and the activity going on. I mean, we have, we had three control rooms and five studios and days when they were all busy and people coming and going. New York, you know, rent, insurance, all of that through the roof. The building that we bought, I want to say we bought it for $240,000, and to buy a similar building now would be an investment of well over a million dollars. Big studios close because they're worth more as a, a home than they are as a studio or something like that. The land value is worth a, it could be a Starbucks or something. Trying to sustain a large space uh, with expensive equipment uh, is just not realistic. I don't think New York really has a, a, a recording studio culture anymore because of the cost of real estate. And in, in London, other than Abbey Road and a couple of other places, there, there really isn't anything. A number of large studios have closed because there is just less work in large studios. Can you even imagine in this day and age, if somebody just wants to do a song demo, of them coming into a studio and paying a big studio to do that? People would not do that anymore. That, that They have software at home. So many of the studios that I, I even worked at as a kid or internet, they're all gone. The business has to change, just like any business when technology strikes. So now it's got to be more about the experience, uh, the service, the atmosphere, the vibe, getting away and, and coming to this creative place. That's really what a commercial studio has to sell themselves on. Budgets have been slashed, so we have to adjust our prices. Man, when I started off, I remember what the, the studio rate at Ardent Studio A was $18.50 a day, plus engineer, plus tape, Nobody batted an eye. Because the, the economy was really in the tank, studio rates le just kind of evened out. Everybody's got their rates down as low as they dare go to be competitive. It does feel like at times there's a little bit of a race to the bottom in terms of rates. Up to a certain level, bands weren't going to studios. Record labels were, would sign a group or an act or something like that, and they would say, we're not sending you anywhere. You're from Rochester. Like, what's the best studio in Rochester? Okay, we're, we'll bring the producer to you. Just, you know, we don't have to pay for gas food lodging. There are so many studios now where guys are charging, what, 50, 60 bucks an hour. That's for the studio, for the personnel, it's for everything. You get 60 bucks an hour, right? That's what studios were getting in 1985. So in 30 years, <laughs> in 30 years, Studios and engineers are getting paid exactly the same amount that they were getting paid in 1985. Okay, you could say, well, things are cheaper now, so, you know, well, I'm sorry, but uh, real estate isn't cheaper. Hiring a contractor is not cheaper. Things are cheaper in some ways, but microphones still cost money. Mic pre still costs a lot of money. Compressors still cost a lot of money. Room build outs still cost a lot of money. That does not change one salient fact, and that is the person who's recording your album is making today exactly the same amount of money that I made in 1985. I don't know that it's just this industry. I mean, it seems to me that this is a problem across the board. If you really look at wages for the Americans, they have stagnated over the past 30 years. Yet, things are two to three times more expensive. People uh, are insured, yet they can't pay their bills. <laughs> the music business is just a, a, a little microcosm of the fucked upness of the whole fucking system right now. And until we fix all of that, but in particular in the music industry, people are gonna have a very tough time making a living in this business. And very few people are gonna find uh, a path to retirement. The worst times were hand to mouth, you know, really dealing with uh, trends that you, every small business knows. A big hurdle is just trying not to worry about where money's gonna come from and where the next session's coming from. And I think the only way of doing that is, you know, you get judged by your last project that you do. Um, and so concentrating on that, what you're doing that day and doing it really well. It's, it's a matter of adapting to the smaller market. So that, that, that's, that's big. And being able to come up with new ideas to shift parts of the business to uh, continue to you know, grow or build or, or, or survive.
These days we have to compete with a lot more than people had to compete with when they, in the 60s and 70s because people have the internet and their phone. They can be watching a movie, they can be playing a game, they can communicate with anyone anywhere in the world, or they can listen to music. Whereas it, in past times, you know, there were three TV channels. They went off the air at 10 o'clock. There weren't that many things to do, right? And so listening to records is something that people would engage in more, in a more focused way. The industry is depressed. It's, it's transitioning. It's just, it's transitioning from the old model to the new model. There used to be a business to it. You know, it was a business. And now it's like a bunch of people make music and they put it up on the internet for free. People listen to it for free. And somehow, somewhere, somebody makes some money. Well, I'm not sure anymore what the music industry is. The music industry <laughs> is kind of this many-headed beast that goes in a lot of different directions at the same time and on a regular basis eats itself. It's hard enough to get, get anybody to want to sign any band, and it has been for obviously eons and eons. But of course, downsizing, you know, now just exacerbates that problem. Right when Too Much Stereo came out, we had redone our deal with Virgin Records and we kind of started seeing a bunch of people at the record label just getting fired. Almost anyone can make a record and most importantly now, can get it quote unquote out there. You can record a record on your laptop, in your bedroom. You can put it out on iTunes yourself. Now, that is power to be able to publish, self-publish, to record yourself, do yourself, and publish yourself, and put it out there. That is serious power. The problem with it is, is not everybody should do that. Anything is available for us to hear. I mean, every song, whether it's great to you or horrible to you, it's right in your face. So the music industry is flooded with shit, with a lot of bad music, and nobody's curating it. And because everybody can record at home, in the computer, nobody wants to pay to come to a place like this. Not nobody, but not everybody. You're no longer bound by, by coming up with that big chunk of money to get a thousand CDs pressed. You know, you don't have to do that anymore. You know, in 2006, streaming came out and uh, Spotify was on the market and then there was Pandora came out and YouTube was, was becoming more and more of a place where people were putting up music and and all of a sudden, sales plummeted, and they continue to plummet. And they've been falling continually for the past 10 years. Our business is affected by changes in the overall studio environment, in you know the worldwide studio environment, which has been affected by changes in the distribution of music. Now, music distribution being primarily electronic now, there's much less emphasis on physical manufactured goods, much less emphasis on retail sales, much less money in the recording business generally. So a lot of bigger recording studios that depended on major label product being their bread and butter, um, a lot of those studios have gone under because the profit has kind of fallen out of that. We started seeing that radio was not actually selling records anymore. iTunes was really bumping. I think the music business imploded because people didn't want to foresee what was going to happen with how technology was going to change the music business. You know, as soon as people, you know, started downloading pirated music in the early 2000s, that's when, you know, a light bulb should come on in the music business and go, okay, we have to change our business model now. If we think we're going to compete with free by selling people $15 CDs, you know, we better get our heads checked. So in 1976, Congress reformed all of the copyright code called Title 17. And in it, they put provisions for how much radio had to pay songwriters for the songs that they spin. We have no such statutory rate for songwriters to be paid off streaming. I got a royalty check the other day, Melissa Etheridge record, she has a soul record. It's a really great record, it was on Concord. I got mixed points on it. I made one penny, one penny on, on that record. So, you know, I mean, what's the point? Bottom line is it's, it's literally the same kind of money. It's $1980, it's $1985, it's the same money. So I have no expectations of making any money. 
you know, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, illegally download our record, which I can't fight it. <laughs> so might as well just accept it. And if they have it and they like it, great. Those people often will buy a shirt or something. And, and realistically nowadays too, especially when dealing with labels, we make more money off of selling a t-shirt to somebody at a show than we do selling a 12 inch record to them, so. I don't think we'll ever get back to a place where you can make Nirvana money. I think today's Billy Corgan doesn't get to buy a Jaguar, but I kind of think that that's cooler too. Nobody's buying music. Sales are, are how we reap the reward. Uh, although these days, sales have, uh, don't exist. The music has become free. That's not right but it's become that way. You certainly don't get it from the streaming services that are out there at all. I mean, it's, it's pennies and it's not, you know, it's just not worth talking about that. I mean, you're Taylor Swift and you're not really making much money from streaming. My income has not waned. I mean, I'm not, I'm still, yeah, increasing every year. Uh, but I think I've just been very fortunate, but a lot of my friends, it's a very different story, you know? Where we used to put out records and then tour to support those records. Now it's sort of the reverse. Now we put out records to support tours. The Apple cart is, is flipped around backwards. Uh, my friends who do indie records and are out on the road, they are only making money playing live and selling vinyl. Go figure. I hate using the term trickle down, <laughs> but you know, like if more people were buying records, you know, more engineers and producers could stay afloat and, uh, and be able to do it well. I don't think the consumer gives a shit. I think the consumer's like, well, music has always been free for me. Even if you're my age, music's always been free to some degree because you could listen to the radio. But the difference is radio is mandated to pay, and streaming sites are not. They think of it as a product that's replaceable, like with any other product. That concerns me, because any art form is so important to a culture. It's the heart of the culture. It concerns me that there's no heart. Society as a whole, we're kind of underfunding our creative people. It's happened in journalism, it's happening everywhere, nobody cares about content. If the general economy has any say in the creative economies, then there are some very rich people and the rest of us are hosed. Well, of course it sucks. I mean, it's just, it's just a different time. And those days are gone, you know? It's just different. Has it affected me? Yes, I'm making less money for the same amount of work. But I'm doing something I love. It was told to me a long time ago, if you do something you love, you never work a day in your life. My account has changed, my bank, but the love of what I do has. I always wanted to own a recording studio, and for my sins, they gave me one. The definition of a recording studio has changed so much over the years. I used to believe in the traditional model because that's what I grew up in, that it was a fancy place with beautiful wood walls and floors and, you know, a dead part and a live part and a big fancy console and everything else. I still love that definition, but I have come to realize in recent years that a recording studio can be anywhere where talented people get together and create. What a recording studio is isn't so much defined by the space that you're in, but what you're doing in the space. Most of the sessions I do now, uh, like nine out of 10, I'm doing in my house, in my studio. There's pros and cons. I mean, the, the great thing about the way the industry is now is that we're seeing a lot of incredible talent develop in bedrooms as people become their own producers and engineers out of necessity. And sometimes it's amazing. You know, sometimes it's phenomenal because it's really pure. And it's unadulterated, it's, it's unaffected by labels or by producers or you know people telling them how things should be. These guys are doing it from bedrooms, from basements, from living rooms. I mean, they're making incredible sounding music with great songs and they're doing it without you know, being elite or rich or having you know, to book out some big studio for you know, 25 grand a week. 
honestly, most of the time when I've gone to something that is like a like a pro studio, it's been there's at least a little bit of like posturing to it, you know, on my end as a performer, like a little bit more nervous or, you know. Um, so there is probably some truth in just more casual the atmosphere, uh, the better for comfort level performing and stuff like that. Playing in studios was always a little bit intimidating. Typically the engineer is a very accomplished musician and they're around really accomplished musicians all day and people put their part down and then I'm like, oh, you know, get real like just uh, stage fright basically um, in the studio. The first guitar solo I ever recorded, I did like over 70 takes and I was like near tears and just losing my mind. And like, that performance is one of the worst things I've ever done. It's like, let it be sort of off the cuff, let it be casual, you know? We did home recordings too, and I didn't have any of that fear, and the process was just a lot smoother just because of the sort of stage fright that, that I used to get in that situation. It's strange that I found like I'm just more comfortable with it being in my extra bedroom, you know? I'm not a fan of tan walls and oak trim and the glass right there and dual speakers with wooden horns and this is a console. You know, who gives a shit what kind of microphone it is if the person is inspired to do their thing in front of it. I've always been fascinated by the control of having a home studio. And by control, I mean control over how much you're spending, control over the availability of time, control over your schedule and ultimately control frequently over, uh, you know, just the, the musical workflow. How does this work? And not feeling bad about walking away from the room if you need to, you know, and saying, it's not happening right now. Now that's the other disadvantage of mixing in a studio is I gotta go there. I can't mix in my pajamas unless I have no shame. The client is paying for that room, so I can't just say after six hours, eh, I'm not feeling like mixing today. Here, I can do that. Whatever, uh, you know, I'm a little tired today. I don't feel like mixing. If I blow off a day, it's because I need to blow off the day. I need the space, I need to reset my head, I need to get away from it, whatever. There's some kind of urgency to it in comparison to a home studio where you can just be like, eh, I'm gonna go make a pizza and I'll come back in a half an hour, you know? But again, there was so much urgency when I had the space that I never could like have fun doing it. Shame Club recorded an album uh, at a place called Mousetrap, the Mousetrap in Norman, Oklahoma with Carl Amburn. Well, he had like a full studio built into this uh, uh, barn in like his mom's backyard. So that was really, really chill. We would just like sleep in the barn. He had like on cots or whatever, and he had AC in the, in the sound room. So like there wasn't a bathroom out there. There was just like a piss tree, like if you had to, take a shit, you would have to go into the house and walk past his mom, you know, and be like, hi. I mean, why, why have to, why be pigeon-held into something? I mean, I think being open to different spaces. Sometimes I record vocals in my bedroom, at my house. And I love the fact that I can do that, because financially and economically, it saves me money to know that I can be able to do that. Or I edit vocals on GarageBand, because I don't have the time right now to learn Pro Tools. I write lyrics in fits and starts, and it's really, really nice once I get that specific uh, lightning strike to just go in and start recording vocals and, and spreading those songs apart um, and getting some arrangement going. And if we had to book a studio <coughs> yeah. at those super, yeah. you know, right at that moment, um, that would be, you know, an obstacle. You know, there's a Rundgren album cover where there's a picture of him and a mic is taped to like a broom up against the back of a chair and it's his living room. And he's at home making a recording. And, and I've always been really, really intrigued by that. Any place that is comfortable and makes good music is a studio to me. It can be cheap and shitty and still have personality and like that's the important thing that I want to convey. If it's just you and your laptop, and you know, a couple hundred bucks worth of gear, you can have your creative outlet. If you want to create art, why should you have a barrier of, of having to you know, be rich or be elite just so that you can create your art? I think it's a fantastic thing.
that everyone can walk into a music shop and spend a few hundred bucks and get a recording interface and, and spend $14.99 and get a bunch of great processing plugins that can reproduce what a, what a big commercial studio can do. Because it used to be that you couldn't, you had to have a bunch of money or you had to be pre-approved from someone else in order to get access to ever even recording stuff. Now every, any kid can just do that on their phone or what, you know, and that's, that's just amazing to me. And some people will see that as a negative thing and I disagree. I think that's a positive thing. There's no reason, you know, nobody else has to press play, you know, but everyone should be able to at least hit record. Yeah. 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 Home recording is definitely picked up, but I don't think that it renders the recording studio obsolete by any means. The thing that you, that one might think is, well, when you have a professional recording studio that you're going to be worried about people recording at home and the home recording revolution and the laptop revolution. And uh, I was aware of that when we started my studio in 1980. I think I'm probably on the sixth or seventh backlash from recording. People go and record at home, realize it's harder than they think, or realize they really love it and then they want to get into a studio and do it. What I've found is that the home recording revolution really has just given me better educated, more experienced clients. If you do a home studio and you record a little bit, you realize why you need to go to a studio. I think that's for a while, a few years ago, we had a big boom in home recording and studios were really suffering. But I think people now are realizing it doesn't sound as good. You need to collaborate with people. You need to have experts and professionals work with you if you want to have a bigger sound. There's obviously the, the studio and the acoustic design of a room that gives it its own personality. But more important than anything are the people that work there. What you don't have is the guy who's been recording for 30 years who knows how to get interesting sounds and push you in ways that you need to be pushed to do stuff. I mean, one of the roles of an engineer is to make the technological process disappear so that the musicians and producers can just get at the music and be as creative as possible and there's not time wasted trying to figure out how to get a sound or how to make the computer do what you want it to do. That's, to me, why people come to studios to work with certain people. In one sense, I think there has been kind of a resurgence of appreciation for what is a, a, a traditional type of production ethic. You really have to be diverse to be able to make it. Had to adapt over the years, and, and uh, or obviously we couldn't have stayed in business the first two years. To become kind of like this eight-armed octopus. Our longevity is partly because we also did related things that also were uh, con contributed to income here. We do rock, but we also do hip hop, but also we're a post house. Programming, uh, coding at the earliest website times, yeah. But then we're also a music house. We could, we've done custom music. It's a recording studio, which is about 7,000 square feet of our 12,000. Um, we have the vinyl mastering suite, and we've expanded that into digital mastering as well. We do the next step in vinyl production, which is electroplating. And then we have a company called Mara Machines, which restores MCI tape machines. Yeah, we weren't afraid to tackle really things a little beyond what the scope of just recording. You know, technology disrupts a lot of industries, and you just have to continue on. There's nothing you can do about it. So, I mean, do, do I see it as a bad thing that now a lot more people have access to, you know, low-priced tools to create art? No, I don't see it as a bad thing. Do I want guys who've spent their, their careers running commercial studios to fail? I don't want that either. The only way for those big rooms to sustain themselves is just to really have corporate clients and, and do film and TV stuff, or else they're just gonna have to like, you know, lose the memories of what they used to make and deal with it. You have to have a core clientele and you have to serve that clientele within their means. And that's our challenge, you know, to make the most of what we've got and, and look out and figure out how we can be a value to people and generate the sort of income that keeps us going. A successful place is probably one that's owner occupied and owner run. Too many paychecks bring the bills down. You know, you can hope that you get millionaires now and again, but you cannot base a business on the occasional occurrence of millionaire clients. And whatever, maybe the millionaire musicians go away, but okay, I'm all right with that. Let me make $30,000 a year writing dumb songs. Nobody sits down and listens to a record anymore. That just makes a guy like me sad. That doesn't mean it's right. I miss that. And I miss the importance of creating that experience for people.
but now other people are creating other experiences. And what I see as an exciting thing is these uh, audio experiences that are being created that I've never even thought of yet. And I see young people who care a lot, and, and that gives me great hope. But I think the pendulum swings, and, and certainly being in business is 30 plus years, um, you see that pendulum swing a lot. In some ways, it's kind of over already. I think like the golden era is kind of past. No reason to be scared of that, you know? It's just the change has already happened. Maybe this is somebody else's golden era right now. The sonic communication business is still very strong. People are talking about budgets going down. I'm a very positive looking guy. I mean, vinyl's selling like crazy. We have the internet now, which means anyone can promote their music and put it out, so there's more ways to get your music out there. The options now are incredible for people, and I think it's not any different than it was back in the day. You just have to be talented, and you have to think outside the box. It's in our court. What can we do to continue to be relevant? In 35 years, we've managed to remain relevant. I think it's a great time to be making music in this industry. Right now I'm working on a project from a band from Singapore. And they hightail me their tracks and I mix it and send it back to them. And that's awesome. I think it all has to stem from a love of music, enjoyment of other people, dedication to doing what we do. I, I have a saying which is, uh, this stuff is way too important to take seriously. I'm not frightened by any of it, I just enjoy it and uh, you know, any obstacles can be gotten around. Often when something kind of dries up, it's, it bubbles up someplace else and you just have to be able to adapt and, uh, and take advantage of that. Yeah, of course it's changed. You don't earn as much money, but, but for me, it was never about the money. I honestly say that, you know, if you make great art, the money will happen. Every artist has their own unique ability to create. I want everyone making art. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think, you know, what will be amazing is if that more people can get attracted to this art and to the art of music and music production that normally wouldn't have. That's the key to success and the key to satisfying work. Because eventually, people will be able to make money in this industry again. It's inevitable. And it's a lot more fun because we don't have some A&R guy breathing down our neck and telling us it needs more shaker or cowbell or what have you. What I want to do is make records that family and friends and a handful of other people like to listen to. Anything we get back from that feels really good. The future of the music business as it relates to the idea of people who make their living creating music, I think is bright. I actually think that how it's going right now is pretty beautiful. There's a, a lot of promise. I think this is probably the best time there is to be in the record business. There's a lot more acceptance of a broad range of cool stuff now. People are affording great music tools. They are making great music. Music definitely is something that is capable of making every single person on earth react. Music is so tied to emotion and it's so personal. It's all I know. What makes your arm hair stand up when something sends a shiver down your spine? It transcends language, it transcends age, it transcends sex, race, everything. It just, you know, it's just amazing. I really enjoy tracking records with musicians. I love the creativity of that and discovering sounds and taking a song and an idea, a vision, a dream, and making it perceptible to other people and fixing it in some way that it will, um, that can travel through space and time and touch other people and make something that will hopefully outlast us and maybe continue to change the world in the future. Making and creating great things, that's what it is. That's what it's about for me. And that satisfies me. And if I can make money doing that, then great. I will continue to do that until I'm dead.